Let's check in with Joseph Lindsley in Ukraine. Joe, Joe. little fucker, Joe Lindsley. Joe Lindsley is quickly becoming an American treasure in broadcasting. text from one of our listeners for Bob and Joseph from Ukraine. Took my very first Uber rides last weekend, and my driver had a Ukrainian flag in his window. And once we started talking, I told him about your wonderful interviews. He was a lovely Ukrainian man who's been here for 10 years, and now he will be listening. And Joseph, I know we talk about how uh, you can't forget about the war in Ukraine. And what's going on in Israel is very important, but uh, let, let's remember uh, what's happening where you are. How are you doing today? Bob, hello from Lviv, still covered in snow. I just finished a run up on the High Castle Mountain in the snow. And it's great to hear, of course, of uh, these interactions in Chicago uh, about Ukraine. And in fact, there was an event over the weekend because uh, there are so many Ukrainian Americans in Chicago. And many Ukrainians are often traveling uh, to Chicago and other places around the States. Uh, and so there was an event uh, with a woman named Maria Belinska. She's really she's been one of the leaders of Ukrainian civil society, especially in getting uh, the best in drone technology uh, to the soldiers. And so, uh, you know, as this goes on, we do see such great solidarity uh, with the people of Chicago. And uh, at this moment, just a few moments ago, it's quiet here in most of the country, uh, but down in the southern city of Kriveri, uh, a missile or something hit uh, just a few moments ago. Uh, but other than that, there was, uh, there was an, another Russian assault uh, through the night. Uh, they sent 18 drones of those Iranian-produced suicide drones. Uh, the, the Russians launched these drones from the Crimean Peninsula, uh, which they occupy, and uh, those were all shot down by Ukrainian air defense. And then uh, the Russians sent eight ballistic missiles uh, to Kiev and the key surrounding Kiev Oblast, uh, to the region. Uh, and what's a bit disturbing about that is uh, the first of those missiles hit at 4.15 in the morning, before the air raid alarm could sound. Now, you know, it's very common for missiles to hit in places near the front lines, like Kharkiv, uh, before the alarm. But usually in Kiev, you have a warning. And this is the second time uh, in the past couple months that a missile's hit in Kiev before a warning. So it was one of these uh, ballistic, uh, quite quite quick missiles. Uh, but all of those eight ballistic missiles uh, were shot down by the Ukrainian air defense. And if you look at it, I mean, the approximate value of those eight missiles is about 30, something like $32 million. Uh, and what did the Russians achieve with that? Uh, they destroyed a, a home and, and a village on the outskirts of Kiev, uh, and 120 people are without power. So that's very difficult for those people, but we need to put this in perspective and you know, look at what was happening one year ago where the, almost the entire nation uh, you know, spent most of their days in the cold without hot water, without power. And now it's extremely limited uh, what the Russians are doing at quite a high cost, $32 million to put 120 people out of power for a few hours. Hmm. Uh, it does, you know, <laughs> you got to question that. And and even as we see this, like, you know, it has been, as I've mentioned often, it's been really since the late su late summer, there has not been major Russian missile, you know, nationwide missile attack on Ukraine. But even with these sort of smaller attacks, you know, because Kiev has not been hit really at all recently, uh, all of a sudden this little attack happens. And if you look at the details, you see it was not very effective. But that doesn't really matter so much to the press. And they sort of run with these narratives. Kiev is being hit again, uh, reported the Daily Telegraph after uh, one of the strikes from late last week. And it creates this impression that the Russians are more powerful than they really are. And so it's very important to look at the details and to see uh, that actually, uh, you know, <laughs> The, the, these strikes, uh, you know, however uh, scary they seem to be, uh, the air defense, thanks to a lot of those supplies provided from the United States, from Germany and others, is incredibly effective here in Ukraine. Is there a lot of talk, Joseph, about President Zelensky's visit to the White House this week? Uh, there is. And, you know, we have uh, swirling around in D.C. Uh, there's a D.C. sort of the capital of, of intrigue and world events right now, in a sense, because not only will President Zelensky be in the White uh, in the White House, but uh, Viktor Orban, the uh, Prime Minister of Hungary, is also in D.C. Uh, these next few days. And Viktor Orban is, you know, he's close with Putin. He really has been an opponent of Ukraine. Uh, currently, in his country, there's a blockade preventing trucks and goods from getting into Ukraine. 
Uh, he, he's he's been a, really a voice against having uh, Ukraine in the European Union uh, and against sending weapons to Ukraine. And he is having a closed door meeting. Uh, this is reported in The Guardian uh, with the Heritage Foundation, which, you know, when I when I was in university at Notre Dame, I had an internship at the Heritage Foundation and, you know, all their rhetoric, you know, oh, we believe in freedom and the U.S. Constitution and defending, you know, virtues and family values. And uh, and and this and, and so that same Heritage Foundation, which, you know, by the way, raised tons, you know, millions of dollars from freedom loving Americans is hosting Victor Orban, who's suppressed freedom of, this, of press in his country. Uh, you know, he, he's pushing his country in a more tyrannical direction. And he's opposed uh, the fight of his neighbor, Ukraine, uh, for freedom and liberty. Uh, so it's pretty astounding that they're hosting him uh, with some leading Republicans in Washington. But at the same time, not far from the Heritage Foundation on the other side of Capitol Hill, uh, President Zelensky uh, will be there in the White House. And <laughs> it's interesting, Orban and Zelensky will be close uh, this week, but they were also close in Buenos Aires uh, over the weekend because the new um, Argentina's new president, Javier Mille, uh, he had his inauguration. And uh, very interesting. I mean, it's, it was unusual that President Zelensky was there because, you know, in the wartime, he's not going to these usual statesman like events. He goes for very focused meetings. And uh, but he was there, you know, wearing his trademark uh, sort of civilian uh, green camouflage. Uh, and he was there uh, for the inauguration of President Mille. And it's remarkable for in two ways. One, you know, uh, the Americans who do not support Ukraine uh, and, and like sort of like people like Tucker Carlson, uh, they really like and admire this new president of Argentina because they like what he says about freedom. Uh, and even Tucker Carlson interviewed Javier Mille uh, recently, but they missed totally the fact that uh, Pre President Mille uh, really supports Ukraine and he sees the fight of uh, Israel against Hamas and the fight of people for freedom in, in China and the fight of Ukrainians against Russia as completely the same thing. Uh, and generally, the uh, I think the sort of the, the, the big media, BBC and others, they don't report on this because they don't like President Mille because he's sort of a pop. He seems to be a populist and too right wing uh, for their liking. So they sort of ignore the storyline. But then the sort of right wing people who don't want to be forced to confront the question of Ukraine, hmm. uh, ignore the fact that P President Mille is a big supporter of Ukraine. And you could see that uh, in the way that he embraced President Zelensky uh, during the inauguration ceremonies. But then uh, uh, whoever came up with the seating, and I'm sure that the new president of Argentina had a hand in this, Orban uh, and Zelensky were next to each other. Hmm. And there was a video. We don't we can't know what was said entirely. <laughs> But President Zelensky uh, confronted uh, Viktor Orban, uh, the prime minister of Hungary. And later, President Zelensky said that it was a frank, you know, he was speaking very frankly about the future of Europe. And uh, and so we, we're seeing these very personal uh, clashes. Um, and as I saw the the sort of the embrace of Mille and Zelensky, you know, since the departure of Boris Johnson as the prime minister of the U.K., uh, you know, there, there are many people who support Ukraine uh, very strongly, but the, I don't know if there's really been a statesman that has developed such a friendship uh, with Zelensky. And, you know, it can be such a lonely spot uh, to be in that role. And, and and so maybe maybe we could see this with the leader of Argentina. And I think, you know, a lots of, of commentators, you know, Ukraine is very unique from both East and West. In the East, in Russia and in China, uh, people are accustomed to having a tyrant. You know, it's a very uh, horizontal structure, you know, you, you, top down and uh, from these self-anointed tyrants. But in the West, we're also accustomed to, you know, anointing our own sort of, you know, figureheads and leaders. And you know, think of all, you know, how caught up people are in, in what political party they support uh, in the U.S. And we were caught up in the personalities. Uh, and I think it's why it's hard for sort of Republican, some Republican Americans to understand Ukraine. Ukraine doesn't have a, a melee. It doesn't have a Geert Wilders uh, because Ukrainians do not have that sort of respect uh, for anyone in power. It is so deeply going back to their roots uh, as Cossacks. And this was called the wild fields. Uh, it is so deeply democratic and sort of a horizontal structure that they don't gra they don't congeal around personalities. And so Zelensky is a very different type of leader. He really is a representative rather than some kind of, you know, monarchical uh, uh, sort of, you know, dictator, benign or otherwise, of, of Ukraine. 
It's all it's all very interesting, and and of course that meeting with President Zelensky and President Biden uh, is going to focus on uh, military aid uh, for Ukraine. Uh, the president trying to strike an agreement with Congress that would provide that aid for Ukraine and Israel. And uh, I know uh, the latest from the president is that he's ready to make some concessions on border security spending. So that says to me that they're going to come up with something and uh, the money will uh, be spent on uh, not only Israel, but Ukraine. So I think I think you you will have some good news soon soon there in Ukraine, Joe. We'll see. Thanks, Bob. And the other question is, even if there is money agreed, the key thing is, will there be a commitment to sending long range weapons so Ukrainians can hit those Russian bases, which they cannot hit right now Mm. uh, to really put a stop to this? That's the key question, I think. More to come. Thank you, Joseph. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Until tomorrow. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for introducing Ukraine on your social media pages. That's very important that much more people can get more information about the situation here and how everybody can help Ukraine to stay stronger and to save all the world. <laughs> well, which side are you on? Not cheat this Come on now. Oh, which side are you on? Not cheat this